Romans chapter 11, verse 25. Here's part of that mystery. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. Now, this phrase, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, is directed at every person who seeks to replace Israel in their theology and in their doctrine. And it turns out to be quite a few people. Uh, the entire Catholic Church believes that they are Israel. They do not regard the state nor the future state of the Jew. They don't care. Um, the Mormon religion is replacement theology. Jehovah's Witness definitely are replacement theologians. Um, a lot of Calvinist churches because of John Calvin are replacement theologians. Refor your reformed uh, churches like your reformed Baptist or your reformed Presbyterian churches, they're all replacement theologians. Um, you have various groups like those who believe in an amillennial view of the book of Revelation or a preterist view these are big words, but basically they don't believe, they don't take the book of Revelation literally. And so it, it can say tribe of Judah, 12,000, but it doesn't mean tribe of Judah, 12,000. It doesn't mean that. Even though it says it, doesn't mean it. Um, they are all replacement theologians. They believe that we have replaced Israel, and that's how it's going to be. Uh, there is no future blessing. There is no future prophecies to be fulfilled concerning Israel. And that basically because Israel, um, because of their sin, they believe that uh, they broke the covenant with God and it's an irreversible breakage. It cannot be put back together again. It's a breach that cannot be mended. And yet here we have our Savior who one of his names is the repairer of the breach. That's, that's one thing that Jesus comes to do, is to take an ir, irreparable breach and fix it, repair it. Uh, but anyway, so the, the lest you should be wise in your own conceits part is directed at them. Uh, and then, like I said, you have your uh, Facebook theologian. These are the people, male and female, who have their nose in the internet nearly 24 hours a day. They stay up late at night. They look at it all day long. They believe every wide-eyed conspiracy theory that there is to believe out there. And usually, a lot of them have to do with the evil international Zionist conspiracy. Um, but they regard not much of the scripture. They think they know what the Bible says, but they haven't read it. Because if they read it, they would never come out with that idea. Anyway, that lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. What is God stating here? God is stating that there is an end to Israel's partial blindness. That it has an end. And the end of it is... When the fullness of the Gentiles takes place, when, when the last Gentile is saved, there are no more Gentiles that will be saved. God knows who that is. God knows when that is. God knows the number of that. He knows everything about it already. It's already written down in his book. And it's not a mystery to him. It is a mystery to us. We don't know it, but it's not a mystery to God. And so when the last Gentile is saved, the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And then, lo and behold, their blindness is going to cease. They're going to now see who it is behind the veil that Moses put over his face. They're going to see the Messiah for who he really is. All right? Uh, so that, and then there's another mystery associated with that. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. Well, looky there. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, 
in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. For the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. That's another part of the mystery. That when it's finished, and it's finished in the days, plural, of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound. And we're not told in the Bible how long that sounding takes place. We're not, that I know of, we're not told that. Um, but it's interesting to me that the, the mystery is completed at the very beginning of his sounding that last trump. So whatever that means... When it happens, I'm sure that God's people will say, that's the last one. That's the seventh one right there. I think this is, I think this is it right here. Uh, and we will no longer, it will no longer be a mystery to us. Now, meanwhile, back at the ranch, Revelation 10, um, let's read First two verses. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud. The rainbow was upon his head. And we've been looking at that. Who did their homework? One snooty member did their homework. One person who is better than all the other students here. And wants to be, uh, wants to move up to the front of the class. Who remembers that game, the head of the class? Remember that game? It was a board game. You didn't ever play that? I liked it. I thought it was more fun than Candyland. Anyway, uh, the homework was clothed with a cloud rainbow was upon his head. The homework was right here, Exodus 16. Okay. Um, was that the homework? What was it? Oh, Ezekiel 33? Oh, yeah. I, I knew that. Um, a rainbow was upon his head, his face as it were the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Well, let's look at Ezekiel 33. Quickly. I'm not hearing anybody turn in their Bible. It's starting to sound a little better. Sound of abundance of rain. I don't remember why I told you that, but anyway. Again, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of, his, of thy people, and say unto them, When I bring the sword upon a land... If the people of the land take a man of their coasts and set him for their watchman, if when he seeth the sword come upon the land, he blow the trumpet and warn the people, then whosoever heareth the sound of the trumpet and taketh not warning, if the sword come and take him away, his blood shall be upon his head. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning, his blood shall be upon him, but he that taketh warning shall deliver his soul. It's our responsibility to sound the trumpet. It is this world's responsibility to hear that trumpet and to heed that trumpet. To take the advice of the man who you set as a watchman. You told him, we're going to pay you. You go up on that tower. You stay awake. You don't get drunk. You go up there and you watch the horizon. And if you see a cloud of dust moving in this direction, then blow the trumpet. Wake us all up out of bed if you have to. But blow that trumpet and warn us so that we can be ready that that sword not overtake us. Amen. But if the watchman climbs the tower, goes to sleep, gets drunk, any number of things, if he's on his phone. All right, listen, I, I followed a guy into Festus the other day. 
he was all over the road. You know, on the side of the road, looking at his phone. And I was honking the horn, honking the horn, flashing lights at him. And he still kept doing it. He's just all over the road. He's a nuisance. And uh, he finally waved at me. You know, yeah, he finally waved at me. Yes, I am number one. And I'm taller than all the rest. Um, but I don't care. I don't care if he's mad at me. Get off your stupid phone. But anyway, if that watchman doesn't sound the alarm, that doesn't give the people in the homes a free pass that they're going to get away with their sins just because the watchman didn't do his job. It's your responsibility to stay righteous so that God doesn't have to bring the sword. God brings the sword upon the land to those who are unrighteous, those who are wicked. Um, so verse uh, 6, But if the watchman see the sword come and blow not the trumpet, and the people be not warned, if the sword come and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. Now, I'm going to say something that I, I'm curious about. If you've heard of the Mossad, they are um, Israel's um, CIA, as it were. Their secret service. Their intelligence network. Um... Israel figured out after the 1972 um, kidnapping of their athletes at the uh, Munich Olympics in 1972, Israel figured out that they can't depend on any other nation to help defend them. They were relying upon Germany to... Uh, protect their people. Germany failed to protect them and then failed to do anything about um, the, the kidnapping of their athletes. In fact, there was one raid that they had worked up where they were going to raid the uh, dormitory where these uh, Jewish Israeli athletes were being held. The problem is that they were trying to sneak in through the roof of the building while all the TV cameras were pointed right at that building and the hijackers were inside watching the raid take place live on TV and they were prepared for it. They could see the soldiers coming on TV and they're going, okay, they're coming through that door, they're coming through that window. So that was a failed thing. Uh, but anyway, Israel decided then that they weren't going to depend on anybody else. That they were going to, they were going to have their own spy network. They were going to, and they already did, but they decided that, that nobody's going to help them. We just have to help ourselves. And we have to take preemptive measures if we have to. And so for the last 40, 50 years, uh, Israel, the Mossad has developed into a very, very, um, well oiled machine that in my, in my thinking, how is it that the Mossad didn't know about the raid yesterday? You see what I'm saying? How is it that the, the Israeli Secret Service Intelligence Agency didn't at least have a few hours of warning because they I'm sure they monitor cell phone traffic. Israel doesn't have the same laws for privacy as we have here. And Israel profiles. They profile everybody over there because they figure anybody who's not a Jew is a threat to us. And so they profile they go through people's luggage, they go through your purse, they go through your cell phone, they look at your emails, they read all your text messages, and they listen to every one of your phone calls. And that's just a way of life over there. If you want to keep peace, that's, that's how you do it. 
I'm just, I'm not clear how the Mossad did not pick up on this. I am reasonably sure, or Hamas, yeah, the Mossad, I am reasonably sure that the Israel spy network has somebody in deep cover inside Hamas and what's that other terrorist organization? Hezbollah. I am reasonably sure that the Jews have somebody on the inside on both of those groups and how they couldn't have known this was going to happen. I don't know. Go ahead. I do too. Could be. Could be. Because it, it's funny when you read Ezekiel 38. You have Gog moving upon Israel. God takes Gog. He puts a hook in their nose. Drags them down and makes them invade Israel. And then punishes them for invading Israel. Okay? It's like he did with Pharaoh. God made, hardened Pharaoh's heart. Made Pharaoh tell Moses, get your Jews out of here, leave. I can't take no more. He causes Moses and the Israelites to leave. And then God hardens Pharaoh's heart again. And Pharaoh says, why did I ever let them go? I'm going to go after them. And he goes after them. But we know why God wanted him to go after them. It's so that Pharaoh would end up at the bottom of the Red Sea instead of the Jews. So it, is it a situation like that? I don't know. One thing I do know, in fact, I will do this this morning. One of the cities that was uh, taken yesterday in the raid was Ashkelon. That's in the Bible. And you ought to see what it says. Ashkelon is cut off with the remnant of their valley. How long wilt thou cut thyself? O thou sword of the Lord, how long will it be ere thou be quiet? Put up thyself into, put up thyself into thy scabbard. A scabbard is what? A sheath for your sword. Rest and be still. How can it be quiet seeing the Lord hath given it a charge against Ashkelon and against the seashore? Jeremiah 40, or Amos chapter 1. God says, I will cut off the inhabitant from Ashdod and him that holdeth the scepter from Ashkelon and I will turn mine hand against Ekron and the remnant of the Philistines slash Palestinians shall perish, saith the Lord God. Uh, here's another one. Gaza. It's the Gaza Strip, which is a, a disputed territory, but Israel has possession of it. And so you have all these Jews living there, and the Palestinians say it's ours. The, the Philistines had it. It's the Gaza Strip. For Gaza shall be forsaken, and Ashkelon a desolation. They shall drive out Ashdod at the noonday, and Ekron shall be rooted up. Here's another one. And the coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. They shall feed thereupon. In the houses of Ashkelon shall they lie down in the evening, for the Lord their God shall visit them and turn away their captivity. Ashkelon shall see it. Zechariah 9, 5. And fear, Gaza also shall see it and be very sorrowful. And Ekron, for her expectation, shall be ashamed. And the king shall perish from Gaza. And Ashkelon shall not be inhabited. Now, I don't know what all that means. As far as what is happening now, but it is Ashkelon and it is Gaza. This is where this took place yesterday. So, think Bible. Amen? Thank you, Pastor Mike. Appreciate that. I always like a supportive crowd. All right. Meanwhile, back at the ranch. Turn to Exodus 16. Exodus 16. 
I am going to preach this morning on the salvation of Israel. And there's just one, one sin you don't want to commit. And that is the sin of cursing Israel. Do not curse Israel. All right, Exodus 16. Exodus 16. Genesis has 50 chapters. What is 50 plus 16? 66. So we're in the 66th chapter of the Bible. Is there going to be something in here related to the Word of God? I just almost bet you there is. In Exodus 16, in verse 10, it came to pass as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Now remember, I think it was last, uh, let's see here, last week, we looked at uh, Ezekiel 1. Well, maybe it wasn't last week, maybe it was never. But anyway, uh, Ezekiel 1, where um, God uh, comes down in his chariot. And when Ezekiel looks at that, he sees the likeness of a throne on it. And one like unto the Son of Man sitting there. And he said a rainbow was over his head. And he said, as the appearance of... Of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, uh, so was the appearance of the rainbow. And he said, this was the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So Ezekiel tells us that the glory of the Lord is going to look like that bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain. What do we have here? We have the glory of the Lord, which Ezekiel said was the rainbow. And it appeared in the cloud. So in this right here, you're looking at a shadow of what is going to happen. When Christ appears in the air, let's look and see what God did for Israel in Exodus 16. And he's going to do this again. Um, if we go back to verse 2 of chapter 16... The whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. They did a lot of that. In fact, Israel spoke the language of murmur better than anybody in the Bible. And the children of Israel said unto them, Would to God we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full, for ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. Who is the bread? Jesus said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. That was me. He said, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out, gather a certain rate every day. Give us this day our daily bread. You know, maybe it's not all that good for you to read 10 hours straight every day of the Bible. Maybe that's not, and I won't say it that way. I'll say more than likely you can't retain 8 to 10 hours of nonstop reading the Bible. I've had people that have bragged about that. I read the Bible 8 to 10 hours a day every day. Who pays your bills? Who's cooking your meals? When do you take a bath? Um, they do that as a boast. They want everybody to think that they know more than anybody else about the Bible, so don't question them. But the truth of it is, it's, it would be like if you tried to eat honey for eight hours a day, every day. How many of you think you could eat honey and honeycomb eight hours a day? Why? Why? It's too rich. It's too sweet. We can only handle so much a day. So God gives them a portion every day. They go out and gather it every day. And if they gather too much, the end of the day, they wake up the next morning, it's got worms in it. It's no good. If they gather too little, well, it doesn't grow. They just don't have enough. But anyway, let me move on real quick. Um, 
And it shall come to pass, verse 5, that on the sixth day they shall prepare that which they bring in, and shall be twice as much as they gather daily. And Moses and Aaron said unto the children of Israel at even, Then ye shall know that the Lord hath brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning then ye shall see the glory of the Lord. What is it they're going to see? Who is it they're going to see? They're going to see Jesus. For that he heareth your murmurings against the Lord. And what are we that you murmur against us? And Moses said, This shall be when the Lord shall give you in the evening flesh to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, for that the Lord heareth your murmurings, which ye murmur against him. And what are we? Your murmurings are not against us, but against the Lord. Uh, and Moses spake unto Aaron, say unto all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he hath heard your murmurings. And it came to pass, as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness. Behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Amen. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, I've heard the murmurings. Um, look at verse 13. It came to pass that at even the quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning the dew laid round about the host. And when the dew that was gone up, behold, it, upon the face of the wilderness, there lay a small round thing as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. It's like a little seed. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, Manah? Which means, what is that? That's hillbilly Jews. What in the world is that? That's what manna means. It means, what is it? For they wished not what it was. And Moses said unto them, this is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. Now understand this. They said that concerning the bread. And then when Jesus came, they said that concerning Jesus. Who are you? What are you? You say you're the son of God. You say you're the savior. You say you're God. You say you're of the, the seed of Abraham, the, of, the, of the lineage of David. Well, who are you? And Jesus answered him so many times. I'm the bread that came down from heaven. I'm the son of God. I'm the son of man. Uh, I am your creator. I'm your judge. I mean, he told him everything that he was. And still, they didn't know it. They didn't understand it. Like here, they didn't understand what the matter was. And so they called it, what is it? What a name that is. But it was on the day that the Lord appeared in the cloud. And so what is the prophecy here? Israel, I believe, is going to have their eyes opened to the real bread from heaven. And it's going to be Jesus, their Messiah. Father, bless your word today. Thank you for it. Father, we pray for the peace of Israel and the peace of Jerusalem. We pray, dear God, for your people. And Lord, I know they're rotten. I know they're evil. I know, God, that they despise the Gentiles and they despise Christianity and they despise Jesus. But they despise Joseph as well. They despised their prophets. Even Moses, they despised him, wanted nothing to do with him. And you sent him, Lord, to be their savior. And they despised him anyway. But Father, you had great mercy and great compassion upon the people, Lord, whom you foreknew. And you will have great mercy upon those people yet again. Lord, my prayer is that I may get to see it in my lifetime the glory of the lord shining in the people of god lord may your word be supreme bless it we pray in jesus name and amen